Hi, everybody. I'm Eric Martin with the Mental Health and Addiction Certification Board of Oregon, MACBO. And MACBO is the NAR affiliate in the state of Oregon, the National Alliance of Recovery Residences. And I'm going to do a short presentation on recovery housing. What is recovery housing versus housing first? Housing first is permanent subsidized housing for qualified individuals that often have mental health and substance use disorders. Housing First is an evidence-based model that helps to ameliorate the harms of mental illness and substance use that is exacerbated by homelessness. This is sometimes referred to as low barrier housing, and some people even call it wet housing. They refer to it as wet housing because there are no prohibitions on alcohol or drug use. Um, so individuals do not have to be abstinent in order to uh, participate in housing first. Sometimes they also call this SROs, um, single residency occupancy units. Recovery housing is a little bit different. It tends to be more transitional. Um, it is transitional or semi-permanent housing for individuals who are stabilized or have completed withdrawal through a withdrawal management program. Um, they've completed or in the process of completing um, substance use disorder treatment services. Recovery housing is also an evidence-based model with a greater focus on substance use disorders versus mental health. Recovery housing offers communal shared housing with peer support, natural peer support within the residence of the house. This is sometimes called the social model of recovery. Communal shared housing has rules regarding behavior and substance use to create safety for everyone in the social communal living environment. Recovery housing is sometimes referred to as abstinence-based housing or treatment-first housing. Now, I'm going to have Jason talk a little bit about the history of Housing First. Well, thanks, Eric. So low-income housing has been an important component of uh, Portland's housing inventory, especially in the downtown area, for over 100 years. From the 1880s until the onset of the Great Depression in the late 1920s, private developers built dozens of two to five story cast iron brick faced single room occupancy hotels. And by hotels, I mean residential hotels falling under the Tenant Landlord Act and not the hotel law. Um, and those operated mostly for working class white men. You'll still see a few of those remaining in downtown today. Some of them are still operating as SROs, but mostly now owned and operated by nonprofit organizations. Some have been remodeled like the Estate Hotel, which I ran at one point, which added two stories to the top and an elevator. And some just uh, uh, um, installed community kitchens or community bathrooms. But there are still a handful that look inside much as they did when they were originally built, um, except now with a century of wear and tear on top of them. Now it was common with these SROs under private ownership, that for people with addiction, they would be preyed upon by both the other residents of the building and by the management of the building and with a constant threat of eviction and homelessness. So these were a very difficult place for people with addiction to live. Now, during the Second World War and afterwards, um, housing was quickly built for Kaiser workers, for new people coming to Portland, for families without breadwinners, and for elders. And in the later period, in the 60s and early 70s, housing was built for people with physical disabilities. That housing, like Columbia Villa, uh, was not built to last. It was built to last a couple of decades and ended up being used for 50 or 60 years. So at the end of its period was pretty, pretty worn and torn. Um, but it was public housing, not private housing. And that was the big difference. If with public housing, usually operated by something like a housing authority or housing authority of Portland, you would have 
predictable maintenance, you would have modest rents, you would have accountable management, you would have a minimum of exploitation. And the idea was in part to reduce the involvement of these predatory and sometimes also religious private owners in low, low income housing. So equity and some um, uh, responsibility would be involved. But by the early 1980s, as housing prices were increasing and the single room occupancy buildings were being demolished, along with the public housing built during the Second World War, being demolished by urban renewal for the most part, and because of the deregulation that was happening both at the federal and the state level for both drugs and alcohol, city managers, city managers started to see an increase amongst the chronically homeless population of people who were uh, had both addiction and severe mental illness. At this time, this is the early 80s, uh, federal funds were on their way to build addiction treatment centers all over the country and um, to, for, to, to provide sort of a public health service to ameliorate this uh, condition. Uh, but the success of these drug treatment centers was really inhibited when a client didn't have housing at all. And there, so their attendance and ability to participate was very unpredictable. Um, so the relationship was start was at the, this is in the early 80s was began to be understood that people who, who have these problems also addiction problems also often have corresponding consequential housing problems and both needed to have equal repair. Uh, Central City Concern here in Portland really led both uh, Oregon and the nation in thinking about this. Uh, and they took advantage of those old SROs in the downtown area. They purchased or leased several of these and then occupied them with people in early recovery. And to manage these, they created something called, and passed it through the Oregon State Legislature called the Alcohol and Drug Free Law, uh, Alcohol and Drug Free Communities Law. And this has been used in the Estate Hotel, the Sally McCracken, the Shoreline, the Barbara Mayer, all these buildings, the eight by eight, they are managed through, their legal processes managed through this alcohol and drug-free communities law. Very innovative at the time. The goal was to create a community that could be sustained in sobriety and to look at the building as a community and not look through the lens of each individual. If individuals drank or used, they would have to leave the program. That was very successful for a long time. Now, housing first was a term first coined in the early 2000s by housing advocates, housing development advocates, and it was really a criticism of this sober housing, essentially saying that recovery was a secondary issue, not an equal issue to housing, and that the two things cannot be accomplished at the same time and cannot be connected. Cannot, housing can't or should not be used as an incentive for a person getting into treatment. Uh, and so one, housing was more important than the other, recovery. From the perspective of persons in recovery, housing first or wet housing as Eric calls it, that's the term we used up until very recently, or where housing management plays no responsibility, takes no responsibility for the alcohol or drug use of the persons in the building, this sort of wet housing presents a substantial threat to people who are in recovery or just starting their sobriety. Housing First is an evidence-based model. There have been numerous, numerous studies showing the effectiveness of Housing First. One of the largest studies was a study of 5,000 people. They looked at participants in Housing First and these participants rapidly obtained housing and retained their housing at a much higher rate than the treatment as usual group. So we're talking about treatment first group. After two years, 62% of the housing first participants were housed the whole time compared to 31% of those who were required to participate in treatment prior to the receipt of housing. The economic analysis found that some cost savings and cost offsets 
Every $10 invested in Housing First services resulted in an average savings of $9.60 for high needs participants and $3.42 for moderate needs participants. Recovery housing is also an evidence-based model. There are nearly 100 quality research studies revealing the effectiveness of recovery housing. So as previously mentioned, um, not as many people stay in recovery housing compared to housing first, but oftentimes they move on and obtain their own housing. Um, here's just a little of the research demonstrating the effectiveness of recovery housing from Dr. Douglas Polson. And Dr. Polson is America's foremost researcher on recovery housing. We're not going to go through all of these different studies, but just to let you know that recovery housing is also an evidence-based model. Now I'd like you to think about this idea of housing choice. So housing first is low barrier housing. There are no rules regarding substance use. Recovery is encouraged and supported in housing first, but there are no, there are no prohibitions on substance use and it's not abstinence based. Recovery housing, some people might refer to as higher barrier because there are rules and prohibitions on substance use. Recovery is encouraged, supported, and monitored in the communal peer support model. Housing choice is where people can move back and forth between housing first and recovery housing. So you might have a person in housing first that wants to abstain from alcohol and drugs. They want to move forward in their recovery. But in the housing first building where they live, um, there might be a lot of substance use, and they feel like it's not a, a good environment for them to try and abstain from alcohol and drugs. That individual may want to transition to recovery housing. These are two models that can actually work together. And when they work together, that's called housing choice, where people choose the housing that they want. HUD released a policy brief on this called the HUD Recovery Housing Policy Brief. And I'm just going to read a little excerpt from that policy brief. Notwithstanding its emphasis on a housing first approach, HUD also recognizes the importance of providing individual choice to support various paths towards recovery. Some people pursuing recovery from addiction express a preference for an abstinence-focused residential or housing program where they can live among and be supported by a community of peers who are also focused on pursuing recovery from addiction environments that are provided by recovery housing programs. However, supporting individual choice must also mean that a community is ensuring that housing options are available for people at all stages of recovery. So metropolitan areas have long supported housing first. In fact, most public funding goes to housing first. And historically, we really haven't publicly funded recovery housing very much at all. So the HUD policy brief basically says we need to be publicly funding both of these models so that people have housing choice. LAPA and the White House Office of Drug Control Policy has put together model legislation. It's basically model legislation that states can copy and paste into their own statutes or administrative rules. This model legislation is encouraging states to adopt rules for public funding of recovery housing. Now in Oregon, we do have a little bit of funding for recovery housing. Much of it is coming through what we call Ballot Measure 110. So they developed model legislation for standards for funding recovery housing. And these standards basically come down to two policies, that recovery homes either need to be NAR accredited or they need to be Oxford houses. And the reason why the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and LAPA 
recommend that recovery homes need to be NAR accredited or Oxford houses in order to receive public funds is because of the unified standards. There are a variety of private recovery houses that have a variety of different rules and policies that govern them. Some have very few rules or policies whatsoever. So these are standards that have been developed by the National Alliance of Recovery Residences in Oxford that ensure the safety of residents, that ensure that there you know, isn't any corruption or kickbacks involved with treatment agencies, that ensure that residents' rights are protected, and they're modeled on science. In a national analysis that we did a few years back, we looked through state administrative codes and statutes, and we looked at uh, private uh, credentialing in states all across America looking at what are the standards that are most universally used. And the NAR standards are the most universally used in states across America as of a few years back. 36 states were using the NAR standards in one way or another. The NAR standards are standards uh, for recovery houses that uh, require that they have a mission and a vision and a decision-making process, that they adhere to legal and ethical codes and they use best business practices, um, that they are financially honest and forthright with the residents in the home, that they collect data for continuous quality improvement. And all of these varied standards ensure the safety of residents and the effectiveness of the social model of recovery. We've actually done some other research in Oregon looking at the nature of recovery housing. We did a survey of 215 recovery housing operators. Uh, we collected data on 77 recovery homes on a statewide referral website. Uh, we did interviews with housing operators. We did interviews with residents in recovery housing. And we did interviews, surveys of the recovery community at large. And here's some of the things that we discovered. First and foremost, two thirds of recovery homes are male recovery homes versus female recovery homes. In Oregon, we do have uh, uh, several LGBTQ recovery homes, but the overwhelming majority are male recovery homes. And this is actually kind of a problem that we have so many male recovery homes. Many of them are re-entry homes for people coming out of prison. And that's probably part of the reason why there is such a high proportion of male recovery homes. But certainly we need to have a variety of recovery homes, culturally specific recovery homes, women's recovery homes, LGBTQ, 2AI homes. Um, so right now it's disproportionately leans towards male recovery homes. Historically, most recovery housing is not funded. Housing First has, has always been subsidized, but recovery housing historically has not been funded. And the the support for the recovery house is paid in the form of rental payments by the residents. In 2022, rent ranged from $525 per month to $627 per month. At the low end average, um, generally people are sharing a room with another resident. At the high end average, people often have their own private room in the recovery home. One of the things that we discovered here in Oregon is that for individuals participating in recovery housing, employment nearly doubled. So we broke it down by Oxford houses versus independent recovery homes. And many of these independent recovery homes um, that were in the survey were NAR accredited recovery homes. We found that upon entering housing in the independent recovery houses, 35.4% of the residents were employed, and upon departing the house, 64.7% were employed. 
Similarly, in Oxford houses, 42.5% of the residents were employed upon entering the Oxford house. 88.6% were employed upon departing the Oxford house. Overall, approximately 75% of recovery housing residents are non-Hispanic white, and 25% are persons of color. Um, this fairly closely matches the demographics of Oregon, but certainly we do need more culturally specific houses um, in the state of Oregon and probably largely across the United States. 85.7% of recovery community participants at a recovery center reported that had funded recovery housing been available, they would have applied for residency. So when we, we what we did is we surveyed uh, community recovery members at a community recovery center. And just to be clear, for those of you that may not know, a community recovery center is different than a treatment center. A community recovery center is a place where people in the recovery community can go to hang out. They can drop in anytime. They don't need an appointment. Um, the community recovery center hosts uh, mutual aid recovery groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Crystal Meth Anonymous, Heroin Anonymous. They also uh, host mutual aid groups like Wellbriety uh, or SMART or Refuge Recovery. They also host community recovery events and activities, and many of them have professional peer support, paid peer support available to community members. So we interviewed people in the recovery community at large at a community recovery center, and 28.5% reported that they had previously resided in housing first. 35.7% reported that they had previously resided in recovery housing and then asked if funded recovery housing had been available, would you have applied for residency? And a whopping 85.7% reported that yes, they would have applied. There are some myths about recovery housing, and one of the biggest myths about recovery housing is that there is a zero tolerance um, practice in recovery housing, that if a person relapses, they immediately get kicked to the curb and become houseless. Um, we found in our survey and interview with operators that this is generally not the case. In fact, 100% of the housing operators reported that they use first, second, and third last chance agreements to help motivate participants for recovery. The only time automatic evictions occur, which are incredibly rare, and they really only occur when residents are distributing substances within the house to other residents and or there are incidences of violence associated with the substance use. So the, the, this is something that is just incredibly rare. So Absent space recovery housing generally isn't zero tolerance, but they do enforce rules around abstinence and the prohibition of having alcohol and drugs on the premises for the safety of the other residents in the home. Another myth about recovery housing is that they don't allow medication-assisted treatment participants to reside in houses. Overall, 27.2% of residents that were in recovery housing were actually actively participating in medication-assisted treatment. So in our survey, we found that in independent recovery homes, and again, many of these are NAR accredited, 29.1% of the residents were actively engaged in medication-assisted treatment. And in Oxford houses, fully 25%, one out of four residents, were actively engaged in medication-assisted treatment. Two-thirds of residents are, incurred, are engaged in mental health or substance use disorder treatment. 
62% of residents are engaged in mental health and or substance use disorder treatment. 17.1% of residents have serious mental health issues and 45.4% of residents are taking psychiatric medication. So this, this kind of idea that recovery housing doesn't allow people taking MAT or other medications to be in the house, I think that's sort of an old carryover from 20, 30 years ago. And it's entirely possible that 20, 30 years ago that recovery housing uh, had that flavor, but most recovery housing doesn't operate that way um, in our modern times. Recovery housing can help with the homelessness crisis. Overall, 46% of residents in recovery housing in Oregon experienced homelessness in the year prior to entering recovery housing. So an estimated 39% of residents in independent recovery homes reported homelessness in the year prior to entering the home and a whopping 58.8% of Oxford House residents reported homelessness within the prior year prior to entering the Oxford House. So, so while it's true that people generally are stabilized before they go into recovery housing, many of them have had recent homelessness prior to entering housing. Recovery housing is less expensive than new construction of SROs. Um, Jason told you about the history of Housing First. Um, and it's important to understand that now, you know, when, when Housing First structures are built, that the price tag is pretty hefty on construction cost. New construction cost on a single unit, an SRO, a single unit ranges between 300,000 to 400,000 per single unit. This is quite a hefty construction bill for new buildings. Recovery housing is a low cost, effective model for individuals seeking a more recovery supportive environment with a greater focus on abstinence. Again, back to that principle of housing choice. Recovery housing runs about 7,200 per year per resident. So this is quite a stark difference from three to 400,000 for a new unit. Recovery housing can be used effectively to help ameliorate the homeless crisis. Individuals who are seeking uh, a more abstinence-based recovery supportive environment, who are leaving housing first, can transition to recovery housing. And this will open up new opportunities for individuals to participate in housing first. So um, uh, we think that, that people should consider funding recovery housing. The federal government, uh, the, Bi the new Biden Appropriations Act uh, talks about recovery housing. SAMHSA has new best practices out regarding recovery housing. So the federal government, HUD, and the Biden administration are now encouraging states to take a stronger look at recovery housing as helping to ameliorate the homeless crisis in the United States. So I want to thank you for letting me share some of this information with you. Um, and I hope you the rest of the conference is a great experience for you. Thank you.